Oh, hello, Next Gens. Thank you. We're going to go ahead and get started here. We're uh, running a little behind schedule, but I want to go ahead and uh, introduce our speakers today. Uh, we have a couple of uh, sisters here who are, who are dynamos, and they're also going to be leading our Next Gen Retreat, which is happening uh, in October out in uh, Keystone, South Dakota. So that's very relevant to everyone in this room. We hope to see you all there for this event. This will be a little bit of a, a preview of some of the things that we're going to be talking about in October. Uh, but like I said, I'd like to, to welcome twin sisters. Uh, Katie Rucker and Jenny Dinnan, uh, they're on a mission to empower and champion family businesses. Having nav navigated their own family business journey for more than 15 years, they're challenging, uh, they're Oh. They understand uh, firsthand how overwhelming and challenging uh, working with family can be. With a passion for family business and next-gen empowerment, Katie and Jenny launched NextGen Collaborative, a personal growth coaching business focused on empowering next-gen leaders to find their voice and craft their own legacy plan to ensure that their journey in the family business feels deeply and authentically right for them. Please join me in welcoming Katie and Jenny. Thank you. Everybody hear us? Oh, man. Hi. I am Jenny. This is Katie. And as Peter said, we are co-owners of McKinsey Corporation um, and NextGen Collaborative. And we're thrilled to be here. It's been um, an honor. We're actually from Southern California. So this is our first time, I think as Willie said, uh, in South Dakota. And it's been a fantastic time to be here. So we are, um, thank you, Peter. Uh, for having us, but really, as Peter had mentioned, of on a mission to empower and champion uh, next-gen family business leaders. So we love that uh, there's a group dedicated uh, to next-gen leaders here. Um, and really why that is, is because we really have been living and breathing this for a while. Uh, we'll get into our story in just a little bit, but um, through this entire process, what we've realized is by finding our own voice and authentically doing it the way we want to, uh, be doing it, it has made it a really enjoyable ride, and we're having a really fun time uh, doing it at the, mo at the moment. Uh, so how many of you in the room have wondered, uh, why did I say yes to joining the family business? Sure, probably. You were the brave one who said yes. I personally wondered that all the time. Um, I actually quit multiple times, said to Jenny, uh, this place is sucking the soul out of me. I don't know if I actually want to be here anymore. So really, our journey through family business, so again, our dad started, and we'll tell a little bit about that, but our dad started the company in 1985. We took over about 15 years ago, so we're a G2 family business um, of our main company, and then, like Peter said, we started Next Gen Collaborative. And the transition journey for us was definitely not always rosy. It was felt confusing and lonely and overwhelming. Um, you know, just like probably a lot of you, we had to navigate what the role, what our roles were as we got into leadership roles, what co-presidency is. So we share the number one role. It's a different kind of model than maybe a lot of businesses, but we had to figure that out. We had to navigate what things were with our dad. You know, he's an entrepreneur. His, we always say he has two passions in life, data, so we're a customer insights market research firm, and his two girls. So if he can have numbers and his two kids in one building, that's where he wants to be. And then when he decided to leave the company, he thought he did, and then we were inside the building and he was outside the building, and it wasn't as cool anymore for him. And so he's been actually out of the business and off the payroll for over five years, and he's really struggling still in retirement. So now wearing the family hat, we're trying to help him figure out what comes next. We also had to navigate kind of the messy middle of things with legacy employees. We have a team members who have been with us for over 25, almost 30 years. And so when you come in as a second gen or a third or wherever you are, thinking about what the culture is going to look like so that it feels authentic to you was a big shift for our legacy employees. And as we started having to also navigate what uh, markets we were going to be doing, services we were going to be offering, and really to be able to stay relevant, that was just a journey that we had to have with those employees as well. So definitely for us, being a next gen was not always an easy ride at all. And so we just want to back up a little bit. We are going to spend the first bit of our time together just sharing more of our story so that you can kind of understand from our point of view like how things were as next gens. And then we are, which they didn't have the handouts ready, so they're printing. But then we're going to have some handouts. We're going to be going through some worksheets 
around on our uh, family framework that we've created as a part of NextGen to be able to help you guys start your process of crafting your really your own personal legacy plan to be able to be thinking ahead. But you know, we just want to first and foremost start out, our story is unique to us, the same way that each and every one of your family stories are unique to you, even as Kimberly was saying, you know, there's all these different ways and versions of it. So our hope out of today is just to be able to share kind of the stories again that we've gone through so that you can take bits and pieces that resonate most with you and you can understand a little bit why this is so passionate to us because there was definitely many times that we didn't feel in the very beginning that, our, that we had a voice and or that our voice mattered. And we really realized that once we made that change in our mindset and realized that we do have a right to be able to have a voice at the table and that if we can have our own visions with what we're doing, um, the whole ride becomes a whole lot more enjoyable. So a little bit more about each one of us. So like I said, I'm a, a twin, I'm a mom um, yeah, of two daughters. So I have a third grader and a seventh grader. I think they're nine and 12. I feel like the ages, sometimes the grades are easier. Um, business owner, we live in Orange County, California. Uh, I have a crazy dog uh, at home in addition, and I'm a CU Buff uh, Boulder uh, graduate. Whoa, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, I like that. Uh, so I, uh, too, am a twin. I have two girls, uh, 18 and 14, so we are right now uh, in the last month of high school, which is a really enjoyable phase. I am a business owner. I live in Orange County, California. I have a crazy dog as well, and I, too, am a CU buff. So as we can tell, you know, sometimes being a twin, and wouldn't it be fantastic if you were running your business with somebody that was your exact opposite, and maybe, or not the exact opposite, that was the same as you, and it might be easy to do, but even as twins, um, and uh, actually Kimberly had mentioned that she, um, that we were on one or two podcasts or webinars, I guess, so we just finished one that was on twins, um, and so we were interviewed together, and then with an identical twins that we know, and we, and we had mentioned we're actually third generation twins. So there's just a lot uh, that goes into the family and what that is. But really, looking at the two of us separately. So my hobbies are reading by the pool. Um, Rom-com is fantastic, like no-brainer uh, kind of things. I love country music, my favorite place to travel. Uh, well, I love traveling everywhere, but by water, uh, the Whitsunday Islands in Australia. I studied abroad over there. Um, and so very much relaxing, I guess I'll say, by a pool. And water is fantastic. So I, which I usually, when I, we do this slide, I say I love everything outdoors. So I've been looking at the icebreakers. I realized that my idea of outdoors might be very different than the outdoors here. So I actually was thinking I should say to Willie, I'd love, I've never been duck hunting before. Like that would be super cool. I don't even know how to do a duck haul thingy, Mabob or whatever they are, like how that works, but I'm all for it. But I love anything on the trails. I always tell my husband if I could live in a tree house, it would be amazing. Um, so I love hiking, trail running, all of that kind of stuff. I love pop music or singer songwriters. Um, when, I, when we first had actually done this slide, uh, Bhutan was where my dream w idea was, but I actually recently came back about five months ago from a 16-day trek to Mount Everest Base Camp, where I camped at Base Camp, um, and it was life-changing for me, and I'm kind of right now thinking about the next one of doing part or all of the Camino de Santiago through Spain. So I am one who is not usually um, sitting still for too long. I love anything that I can be physically moving my body, immersed in culture and learning and really off the grid as much as possible. So that's, uh, you know, the thing is, is that it is awesome to be able to say, you know, you can be very similar, but very different. And if you had asked us in high school, if we would be together, uh, we would look at you like you were absolutely crazy. We actually went to two different high schools. We, we always say we hated each other, but I want to maybe say we strongly disliked each other. Um, and we just never would have thought that we would have ended up being where we are here today, but now we absolutely love it. Mm -hmm. So backing up about um, for the business group, um, and Kate mentioned a little bit about it, but more so, Dad started our business in the bonus room of our house in 1985, so next year will be 40 years in the data and analytics space. So we do a lot in the power sports space, so uh, motorcycles, boats, ATVs, so we do do a lot of uh, outdoor things, um, but... We really started in that space, so a lot of customer satisfaction surveys, product development surveys, a lot of things in that space, which is a lot fun. We actually, when we were at the airport yesterday, we had some guys flying to Minnesota um, out there with one of the motorcycle uh, manufacturers, which is fun working on projects. So 
But dad was very different from us, the way that he ran the business, the type of people that he hired, of what he was doing. Uh, lovingly, they called themselves data nerds, introverts. Uh, they did not sign up for Kate and I to be uh, the owners of the company, uh, of where it is and what it was. So this is the founding of where it was. I will also say and kind of how we got here. Uh, we grew up with two entrepreneurial parents. So we didn't grow up in a family business per se, so our parents are together, uh, but they both ran two different companies. And so it was not ever, you need to join the family business, this is to take over. We did grow up data entering customer satisfaction surveys and a whole lot of other things there, but both went off to college, um, to the same college, I don't know how that even uh, came about, but, uh, and I was a marketing major and went off to Home Depot, HSBC Bank. So every uh, marketing major dreams about uh, joining a big firm and selling non-prime, subprime auto loans. That's what I did. Uh, then I was in charge of two to four page flyers uh, at Home Depot and living in Orange County. Uh, I was doing ice melt, hurricane preparedness, uh, and HVAC uh, flyers and training there. But after being out, I'd say in the real world, which I do think that there is a, a tremendous amount of benefit of going out and seeing what's going on there, I started realizing, hey, this maybe isn't what I want. You know, we grew up in a family business and we saw how our parents treated their employees and the culture that they created. Um, and it really wasn't, I started realizing I'm tired of spinning my wheels and helping other people get their uh, next job or their next promotion. Maybe I want to come back and figure out what it is uh, that they did, because I do know growing up, I'm not 100% sure what dad did growing up. I knew there was computers, motorcycles, and he traveled a lot, but we didn't 100% know, so we started coming back in and asking. Yeah, so I studied sociology, so I'm just fascinated by people, the inner workings of kind of tribes and communities. Um, but I actually followed my mom's footsteps for the beginning part of our pro professional career. So she had a corporate meeting and event planning company. So I got a job down in San Diego when we first graduated, working for a different firm, but doing uh, that same thing. And then about a year and a half later, I moved up to Orange County and started working with her at her company. Uh, we closed her business down in 2008, actually, as our speaker was talking about, when the economy wasn't so great and businesses weren't spending as much money on that. And she originally said, don't you want to take it over? And I'm like, no, I don't want anything to do with this. It's like not exactly what I'm interested in. But um, at the time, I then didn't know exactly what I wanted to do next. And our dad had a job offering, um, really, I was basically a file clerk. I came in at the very bottom of one of his divisions and departments, and I thought it would just be a quick stopover job and that we just kind of figure something out for about six months, and I never left. Uh, and I think, too, like, as Jenny said, I, we both had different paths in there. Jenny was worked there, and then she left, and then came back. But we both pretty much came in at 2008 and never left from there. And none of that was really intentional. As she said, our dad, he, um, with his long-term client that he had, he really worked on five-year contracts. And so around that time, he was signing one more five-year contract. And he said on 12-31-2013, last one out, locked the door. And his whole concept was to be able to just shut the business down. He had achieved his goals, his two goals for starting his company. He wanted to wear shorts every day to work, and he wanted to support his family. Like, those were the two things. And so he wore his shorts. Simple, simple man. <laughs> simple man. And so he had achieved that, and he was going to finish something out, and then and that's where, again, the timing was that we both kind of came in there and started that process of learning a little bit more about what was going on in the company and decided to stay. So in thinking about us, and yeah, I came in under the research part of it and started sales and marketing and things. So with, um, and really through the transition of what we've done, but you know, I'm a doer um, and I'm a big picture thinker. Uh, I love new ideas. I'm always like, hey, there's got to be a better way to X, Y, Z of what this is. And um, we've done every uh, strength or every uh, personality uh, test under the sun, and I'm definitely, I'm an includer. I love meeting new people. I love um, engaging with new people and figuring out. It drives my husband bat crazy because I'm always inviting someone over. I'm like, hey, we should invite so-and-so to this party, and he's like, this is not our party. I'm like, it's okay. They're going to like them, and they're going to get along, and it's going to be great. So I love bringing people together. I love new ideas. I love thinking about how do we start, um, you know, my, uh, one of them we wrote our purpose statement a long time ago, and it's uh, to rally people together to empower brands to reach their audacious goals. Like, I don't really have interest in status quo. I'm always thinking of the next big thing that we've got going on. So one of the things, um, and in looking at the company and kind of where, and this is where we're going, 
um, in just a little bit, but started to see we didn't have that at the company. You know, we kind of say that dad caught lightning in a bottle with this company of where he started. I'll say starting uh, a data analytics firm uh, 40 years ago uh, to now, uh, it is crushingly overwhelming <laughs> keeping up in this space and extremely exciting at the same time. But dad really got in. He burrowed down into some very fantastic clients uh, that are still clients today, 30, 40 years later, um, by hardworking, um, referral, that kind of thing. But we did not have any sales and marketing at all when we started the business. Um, so I started realizing, you know, this is something that if we're going to grow and um, expand this business, this is something that I really want to be able to step into uh, and do. Um, I think there's kind of later when Dad thought about that position. Say yeah. that. <laughs> there, so I am a doer for sure. I am all about consistency and efficiency. So I naturally went into the admin and operation side of things as Jenny like doesn't, she's never met a new idea she doesn't like. She, I actually bought her an idea jar so she could put all those super ideas on a sticky note into the jar because then I always say I have to like run behind her to try to figure out how to actually like put them into action. So I love a to-do list. There's something therapeutic about putting that check or crossing it off as you're doing things. And actually, yeah, the one story you were gonna share was our dad came into my office one day and said, you know, I just want to say I'm really sorry. And I was like, why? And he's like, you're working so much harder than your sister. You know, you're doing all of it because you're putting process into place and systems into place. And she's just out there having lunch with people and like chatting it up and everything. And I said, but I think that's what her job is now. And he's like, nope, she's supposed to be in here. You make sales from inside. I was like, oh, okay. Butts and seats. If, Butts you, were, and if, you're, seats. if you were in your seat, you're working. It's his, yes. And you had to be on a spreadsheet, yeah, working on a spreadsheet. Yes, and so for me, again, it was coming in and really trying to look at when you take from a G1 to G2, at least for our say, um, thing, is then trying to put in systems and process in place to be able to scale and grow things. So definitely started doing that, but from a lens for me around people, as Jenny said, her um, purpose statement is more around these audacious goals to help brands go. I really care at kind of the people granule level. So mine is how do I um, awaken the potential in others so they can grow wings and soar. So really our whole philosophy for, for me from the HR perspective and training and leadership development is how can we create systems and process to be able to help all of our team members, not just ourselves, be able to thrive, thrive and reach their fullest potential. And again, as we kind of talked about in the beginning, that was fundamentally different than what, how our dad did things. He's like, this is your job, this is how you're gonna be. So they never did any sort of leadership training, never any sort of coaching and that kind of thing. So even in the beginning of starting to come up with these ideas, uh, the team just kind of stared at us like, I don't know what you're talking about. So we just had so the to job description trying. when she was saying next door, that was not a thing, <laughs> team meetings were not a thing. I mean, it was a whole different world and culture. Yeah, but as we were also starting to, because again, as we said, we really didn't get along. So we we're starting to figure out how each of us are a little bit different and those types of things and trying to figure out what a co-leadership role might look like. And probably that's coming because we are twins. So we're always used to doing things together. But for me, I always thought that I would make a great number two. I really defined that CEO role like in my mind, whether it's right or wrong, is that it was based on innovation and ideation. Like that's what the CEO's job was. And I didn't think that those were the strengths that I had. Yeah, so I think that um, we're going to the next Nope. Yep. <laughs> so I think then really one of the biggest areas that Jenny was concerned then about mm -hmm. is she would come up with these new ideas and this is a kind of comes back that I love a to-do list. And so if Jenny was really concerned about saying, you know, I have all these ideas and I could be great up here and doing these kinds of things, but I'm not good at actually making these things happen. And she was really afraid of offending me. And I was like, ooh, bring me more problems to solve. So we started really being able to figure out how can we work together in those types of things? I think but I, that's, that was definitely a very big, kind of keep touching on this, but being able to come to Kate to say, you know, this is what I want to be doing, what do you want to be doing, and how does this work together? And starting to realize for the company that we wanted to be growing going forward, um, we needed to figure out this blend between the two of our leadership styles. Like, I don't know how now people run a business without their exact opposite. I mean, I don't, the business would not work if it was all new ideas all the time. Um, and it probably wouldn't work if you were only implementing what was happening in front of us. So we really worked on figuring out that kind of co-leadership together. 
Yeah, and I think another really big thing that we did, and so again, we're sharing all of this so you can kind of understand what got us to where we are today about being able to really articulate what our voice is. But for us also, we realized that a big pivot point for us was we all have our narratives that we bring with us, right? That we grew up with these comparisons or these ideas. And so for me, I, whether explicitly said from our parents or not, which I think was actually even talking kind of about that favoritism thing. So Jenny was the captain of the cheerleading squad. She was the ASB president. She went to business school and I was the total opposite of that. Um, and so then- which Why we didn't get along. Which is why we didn't get along. Um, and so I think some of that was, there's, there's all of that. We just are going to either keep those narratives and that family dynamics with us, or we had to start figuring out how to put some of that on the table. And I recently read this awesome book, and there was this uh, metaphor that I really have like related to this thing, where he talked about how we all carry our baggage through life with us, and that we actually have the opportunity to put our baggage down and like just rest. But in my mind, I actually was thinking, like you think about your baggage, you maybe have like your little rolly suitcase where the wheel's a little janky, but you don't go out traveling too, too often, so you just deal with it and you like bring it with you. But that thought that we actually can like put all of that baggage down on the ground and or out on the table as we start having brave conversations with our family members and say, what baggage or what luggage? And even that language scenario, I don't want the baggage anymore. I want some new awesome luggage. So even like my trek to base camp, I had to get this awesome new backpack. But you have to be minimal about what you can actually put in the backpack because you're carrying it for 16 days. And so then I can actually say what parts of my like history and story, it doesn't mean that that's ignored or forgotten completely about, but I don't have to carry the weight of that history around with us. And I can actually say, what new luggage do I want going forward on this new path? And that's been like a really big thing. And so we started really being able to realize we have this really awesome opportunity to work together to keep our family legacy and our family business going forward. But to be able to successfully do that, we either were going to continue competing with each other, fighting for the top role, that in the end, neither of us wanted alone. We both want to be home, like we want to work four days a week so we can be home with our young kids. We want to do all these things. We realized that we didn't need to let our egos get in the way, that we had this opportunity to get to know each other for our strengths and our passions and our quirky personalities and the strengths that we have today, and that we realized that we that we have like a new friend, you know, like our siblings and our family members can actually become our friends and our cheerleaders and our confidants in a positive way. So that was just a really big process that we had to go through to get through all of this, that that really made like a massive difference for us. So I do think, you know, through this process and, you know, if, if you would have asked us a long time ago, I don't think we would have said that this is a good thing, but I will say through all of the, um, and we're fast forwarding, I'm going to share just a little bit more about the journey, but we are so happy and excited that we have gone through this, kind of the, the pain and the struggle and all the times that Kate would call me quitting, uh, she would come back uh, always, which is nice, thank you, uh, that it is worth it, you know, and that we just are starting to realize uh, that it also, all of the journey along the way is making us the leaders that we are today in order to build the company, companies uh, that we're building today and growing forward of what we want to be able to do and achieve, uh, which is really exciting. So. You know, I think that, um, looking at me, because I probably should have my notes. So yeah. she's got notes over there because she's a note person. Yeah. Uh, so if I'm missing stuff, you let me know. Um, That's okay. So here we were talking just a little bit about the messy middle, about our transition yeah. here. Yeah. So a couple of the things that I just wanted to say. One of the things for us when we came in and took over the business, well, uh, multiple things. I mean, we spent days talking about all the different pieces of going through this process, but at least of a few different ones. When we decided to come back into the business, um, you know, one of the things that we really thought in our minds was we need to be running the business the way that dad ran the business because that's the way that it was and it was successful. And definitely some of the legacy team members and things like that, that was the narrative that was going on. But we started realizing that's not true and authentic to us. Like it just did not feel authentic and it was not feeling fantastic. Um, I was definitely sitting in my dad's um, old office and in his desk, and I was thinking, I cannot work on spreadsheets all day long every day, because that's what we were doing, that's what dad did, and I had that job um, all day. I would call my husband, I'm like, I'm literally talking to the walls, they're not talking back, and I can't do this for the rest of my life. So trying to figure out, you know, how do we make this our own, and really having this shift of saying, wait a second, we have agency over our lives, we really do, and how can we step up and start saying, what is it that we want 
um, to have happen and what is the role that we wanna be playing in these family businesses. So we hired a transition consultant, made a couple things uh, that we did and really worked through a plan and that's part of uh, kind of the family framework that we have here, um, which has been fun. So really then transitioning into being co-presidents and as Kate mentioned, our bankers and lawyers, accountants, everyone said that that's a terrible idea and we can't do it. Uh, and then we said, well, why not? This is our business. We can do uh, what we want to. And we do now, and it's uh, fantastic. So running, uh, being co-presidents, and just last year becoming entrepreneurs and starting our own business, uh, which has been really fun and exciting because why not run two businesses uh, together instead of just one uh, as we're through this? Yeah, and I think really, as Jen said, our biggest thing, because again, we could talk about kind of sibling partnerships, succession, all of that stuff for a really long time, but our number one thing is that realizing, because actually why I kept quitting was because I just start, I was trying again to do things the way my dad did, or we just kept butting heads and realizing that things just weren't going to work out, you know? But then I always say, I said, I get one shot at this life, so it might as well be amazing. Like, we might as well just try to make it and make ourselves as happy as possible. And we can feel obligated to be a part of the family business, or we can feel whatever, but in the end, we still have to own that decision. And then we have to decide how we want to move forward from it. And so either we can start crafting what our own voice is and being able to do those types of things. And I know that sometimes that doesn't always feel easy, but I think we just have to, as individuals here, take that ownership and like realize that we do have that right to be able to say, what am I gonna do at my one shot in life? And then be brave enough to start doing some of the work to come up with a plan, come up with a vision for what that's gonna look like, and then take that. So we talk a lot about creating then our own personal legacy plan. So I know legacy is talked about all the time, all over the place in family business, and that's a lot talked about wealth generation, assets passing along, uh, family values. For me, I when I hear legacy though sometimes, and I don't know how you guys feel, is sometimes it's that I'm having to honor what someone else created, and that it's hard to always figure out where my voice fits within that, and I know that it does, ish sometimes, but sometimes it's that you feel like you're the steward of someone else's history and that you're having to make all of your decisions to make sure that you honor what your parents did or your grandparents did. And in doing actually some of this research for our talk today, I found an article at HBR um, that was an article called How to Build a Legacy That Your Family Biz How to Build Upon the Legacy of Your Family Business. And I just I want to read the quote because it was really great saying conventional wisdom holds that family heritage, or I would add family legacy, like wealth and reputation, belongs to the older generation. And in this way of speaking, the succeeding generation, all of us in here, were merely stewards and caretakers that were given that inheritance or entrusted with the family business, and then were charged not to screw it up. And so framing it this way, legacy can feel a lot more like a burden than a gift. And I'm all for being able to 100% honor my parents and what they're doing and how they're doing things. I want to make sure that they're remembered for what they've built. I want to make sure that their strong values are still the foundation of what we're doing. And I want to know that I'm living the life that I feel like I'm meant to live, whether that's how that's within the family business and outside of it. And so I think the big thing here is we believe that this is a yes and, not a one or the other. And I think that's the biggest thing is how do we really start to lean in and say, what do we want? Not just within the family business, because us as participants within that family business is one part of who we are as individuals, right? I'm a mom, I'm an adventure seeker, I just like love all these different things, and I want all of that to be a part of my longer term legacy, and I don't wanna feel that I'm a burden to my family because I want those things, but to be able to get that conversation started, we have to actually start thinking through what we want in our own lives so that they know how to be able to help and support us. It was just a really big mindset shift for us when it was um, in order to honor the legacy, honor dad and what he did, we didn't, it didn't mean that we didn't have a voice at the table and it didn't mean that we couldn't have something uh, and be doing it um, our way of what this was. It was just this whole entire mind shift and everything started changing once we um, got in there. So 
I was going to say, I think one thing, too, even on that, because um, we always say, like, we want to be able to help Katie and Jenny from 15 years ago. And really, in the beginning, when we started these conversations, as we said, our dad didn't have the idea of passing this business on. So we actually approached him with it, and then it became his idea, which is usually, like, how things like that happen. And so then he was like, oh, I talked to Jim, who was his next-door neighbor. And he's like, and the Jim says that this is how it should go down. And then he'd, like, pass the, like, plan across the table. We're like, oh, okay, I will take a look at this. And I said, Jenny, I think we should get a lawyer. Like, we we should like look, have someone else look at this, but I didn't want to. But we him. only knew his lawyer. So but we only knew his lawyer. And then like he's like, we're gonna have another meeting. He like says, we schedule this meeting. And he's like, I talked to Russ, who was a lawyer for a big company who'd never done any sort of succession like our family governance. He was a corporate lawyer for Yamaha Motor Corp. And I was like, I'm not sure what Russ has to do, but Russ wrote a great little plan. And so I was like, oh, thank you, Russ. That's awesome. And so then we just sat there, and you're like, OK. And so even still now, I said to Jenny, I was like, I don't even know what half the trust means. Like, we signed our name onto something because we didn't actually know that we could say, hey, I'm going to ask a lawyer about this. Now, I will every once in a while say that to my dad now, and that doesn't always go over very well, but I still will call my lawyer first. And so we like then have these plans. But in the end, we just want people to know that you in advance so that you're not sitting there kind of like we were of just like signing things because your dad told you to that you actually have a right to be able to find your own lawyer to look at your documents before your dad makes you sign them. <laughs> yeah for sure uh i'm still confused by a lot of the things i'm always like can you i think he thinks that if he talks really fast um and uh quickly then i'm not going to ask questions but it's like my it department now i'm like guys i'm still going to ask if it's going to be on time and on budget because i'm like like you're trying to hypnotize me here and I'm still going to slow down and ask questions. But I wanted to make sure that we're all on the same page here of what we're talking about, at least for um, this is next gens, our definition of personal legacy. So I just wanted to at least read the definition of what we have for personal legacy. But personal legacy really meaning the enduring and positive influence an individual leaves on the world through a combination of their actions, values, achievements and character, uh, which collectively serves as a guiding light, inspiring them to make a difference. So this is what we wanna make sure. We're not saying, and as Kate said, this is not an either or. You don't have a business legacy or a personal legacy. This is having both of them and be able to figure out what is your personal legacy of coming into the business and where this is. And really, as we see writing this, and I think Peter's uh, handing out some, so we're gonna go through a document here in just a little bit. Uh, and spend some time, you know, Kate and I are talking a lot here, but let you guys work through uh, some pieces. But making sure your personal legacy plan also needs to be a living, breathing document. This is not something that you do one time and that's it. You know, these chapters in our lives of how we are and what we're doing, it's, it's, it can change. Things can change. We'll kind of talk about that uh, as we go through here. But want to make sure that this is something that should be revised and reviewed because during different chapters of our lives uh, is where we are. So, just to unpack this a little bit and personal legacy before we get into the uh, handout that Peter just did, but those four things that I just mentioned. So really impactful actions and making sure, you know, that our actions, that, that they are intentional, right? And they're impactful of like what we're doing. So currently, I mean, running two businesses, I'm also president of the board of a nonprofit, having two young kids at home doing these things. I need to be very intentional about my time. Uh, and where I am, um, as Kate said, you know, four days a week, which are we doing four days a week? I thought that was only during the summertime, but during I was like, summer. wow, did we just change your policy? <laughs> what was happening there? Um, but at least, and my husband um, is at home uh, with our girls. God bless him. He is an angel. Uh, but it has been a very intentional thing for me just recently to be able to say, hey, I'm only out one night a week. I'm in sales and marketing. So if anyone is in that role, you could be at a breakfast, lunch, and dinner all day, every day. Um, and my husband says, you never say no to anything. I said, honey, if you had any concept of everything that I say no to, you only hear about the things I say yes to. But I have recently in the last you know, six months said I'm only out one night a week away from my girls, except for when I'm traveling for this type of thing, um, and so that I'm there with my family. And so making sure that the intentional actions that we're doing uh, make sense. I will just share a win uh, at home the other day. He said, it's really, you know, it's really been affecting our family in a positive way, having me there more often, which oh, has any working mom uh, can attest to that. It feels nice that then uh, showing up and being there. 
God, so that we want our achievements to be significant. And it doesn't have to, again, be these big, huge, audacious goals. It's just that we want to make sure that they're significant in ways, again, in alignment even with our intentional actions. We want to make sure that we're being mindful about what we want to achieve and where our growth opportunities are. And that's one of the great things, too, about, and we'll work more at the Next Gen Conference to be able to come up with a plan of being able to say, where am I today and where do I want to get to so that you can start taking some aligned actions there. And again, even as I said, I, working almost my whole professional career, so I know this is actually a lot of times next gens have to go work somewhere else. And for me, I didn't have a lot of achievements outside of the family business. And my mom lovingly always said, you know, I learned everything from her. And every time I heard that, I heard I am who I am because of what she made me be. And I am only as good as that. And so that basically she has all of my achievements and I've only achieved because of her. And that was its own, which we'll get into about assumptions and limiting beliefs. That started to be a narrative for me that was not a positive one. So about 10 years ago, I actually started taking aligned action to be able to say, how do I start changing this for myself? And I want to be able to know that I can achieve really big things all on my own. And so I did a year of yes. I started saying yes to all sorts of crazy things uh, just for the sake of being able to know that I could do them outside of the business. I'm all about how do you find a safe space to mess up and uh, learn some lessons so it doesn't impact everything. So my first yes was saying yes to a half marathon. I'd never run more than like three miles at a time. And, and again, I didn't know that 10 years later I'd be making it to Everest Space Camp. So one yes can turn into a big, huge, audacious achievement, but you know, we just have to start being intentional about those actions. And then really profound values and really being able to, which I know we've talked a lot about business values, what your family values are, but being able to do a values assessment for yourself. And those values can change over time, right? And then we want to be able to start to say, so if family, like Jenny's family is one of her key core values, she wants to make sure then that her actions is alignment with those values itself. So we want to be able to make sure that we're always being conscious and aware of what our values are, again, for ourselves, so that then when we get to the table with our family, we can then match to see how our personal values are matching against the family values and then matching against the business values. I know I love actually I think Kim was just talking about this is this is what we as Edelman's do like that's like a family value that you can have uh, where she was just talking a little bit about that but it's okay to have a personal values too and then okay then where are you and what really matters uh, which I think then goes back to then that unwavering character you know for us and I always want to make sure then how do people describe me when I'm not in the room you know, I want that to be consistent. I want it to be consistent in good times and in bad times of your character, of how we are, how we show up, and just realizing how much agency we have over our lives as we're creating these plans uh, going forward um, in there. So uh, I know that Peter, like bizarre, because I can't see a ton with the lights up here, but uh, I think that he handed out uh, a worksheet that we're going to go into a little bit. So we created the family framework um, at Next Gen Collaborative, which we'll get into um, each one of these sessions and uh, take some breaks here. But we wanted to make sure that this was a, a purposeful uh, plan and really introspective to be able to figure out what is it that you want, right, in your life and where, do, where are we at today? Uh, where are we at going to be going forward? Um, and making sure that we're being intentional about that, what that is. And so walking through each one of these. So we're going to be walking through family, uh, family dynamics and futures. We kind of cheated a little bit and put two Fs in there. Um, we uh, assumptions, mindset, identity, legacy uh, for each one of these and making sure. So as we're going through, uh, we're going to talk about a few of them, um, have a break, you know, five minutes, however many minutes to be able to do. This really is a personal thing. I don't know who's, we didn't say don't sit with your family members or anything, but as you're going through, this is a personal legacy plan for you, uh, but it is fantastic to share with others, to start, you know, what is it that's here, what are you hearing from others, what, what are they hearing, so that we can start really challenging each other, learning from others, and figuring out what's happening. So definitely while you're doing this um, of sharing, we won't make you stand up and say, this is my uh, big life goals that are happening. And I just want to say, too, uh, with Kate, even with those achievements of where we're here, because it doesn't have to be this massive thing. I mean, I have zero. Everyone says, okay, when are you going to Everest next? Not. Not doing it. Not going to happen. Uh, so it doesn't have to be these massive things that are happening uh, for here. But uh, So we'll go into each one of these uh, sections.
Yep, so we are gonna start, we're gonna dig in on page one here. So the first page here, and we'll go through both of these two sections, and then like we said, we'll pause here. So the first section here is around family dynamics, which we know this could be like a whole three-day conference just talking about family dynamics. And so, and again, each, of us, family dynamics impacts us in the business. It impacts each and every one of us because we have that. And even being twins, we've lived the same life, but we have completely different perspectives on what, how we grew up, how our parents treated us, but we were always there like living the exact same life. So we all have our own way that we're perceiving those types of things. So in this first section, we want you to get started by really thinking about you know, your family at a granular level. Like who are all the different types of people that you have relationships with? So it's your siblings, your parents, your grandparents, if you are connected within your family business with your aunts, uncles, cousins, you can start getting down to that granular level. And then we have different kinds of questions to be able to think about here. So what are some of those key drivers that impact who you are today within those family businesses? Are there unwritten rules that happen within that? You know, are you, and is one of the roles that you have to play, you're the ringleader, like all your brothers and sisters call you and ask you what mom wants for Christmas. And you just are that person. Now that may not be what the role that you wanna be playing, but that's what the role is today. You know, how do you describe fam or communication in your family today? How do you describe trust today? Um, are there clear lines between family and the business in itself? How do you feel supported right now um, by all these different layers within your family on your own personal individual goals? Do you feel support from maybe one person but not others? So again, this is a lot, probably way more than we're gonna be able to dig into today, but we want you to at least get started on the process and then continue on with that uh, through the process or through it for some homework. And then the next one on well, the... And even just on that, just real quick, so I think if, if we're thinking about family dynamics, so is this, you know, at home, is this at work? Like, yes, this is kind of whatever's coming up right now because we are, family dynamics is a huge piece, right? This is not just, uh, and even thinking about every role that you're playing, because I know when I'm a daughter at work that I'm one thing, when I'm a sister at work, I'm one thing. So just as they're coming up, this is, does not need to be only when I'm in the office. So family dynamics as it relates to the family business um, is what we're talking about here. Yep, and then the second part of this uh, first page, which you'll actually see um, up at the top, it says a time frame up there. So the second part of this is thinking about our family dynamics, because we'll talk about futures on the next page, but thinking about family dynamics. Put a time frame here on the top of this. Is this that you want to start thinking about three years in the future, five years in the future, or it could be 12 months in the future, but if you had a magic wand and you could say what your family dynamics would look like, what would it look like? How would things change? How would your communication change? What would be a different role that you would have? How do you wish that you would get supported? How do you wish people would talk to you? Those types of things. And, and let go of the narrative that I am 100% guilty of. So I will think that maybe some of you have is, well, that will still just never happen because mom or dad's never going to change. And that, totally get that. But this exercise is for you. This is for you to be able to say, in my dream world, what would my family dynamics look like? Because by being able to start putting some of those ideas and those thoughts of what you wish the future dynamics could look like is going to help you start having a clear path to be able to even start working on one or two little areas that you want to be able to fix. So that's kind of what we want to have you guys do. We want to take a couple minutes here to start digging in on that, write down some notes, kind of share some ideas amongst yourselves, and then we'll come back for the next section.
writing and doing these things, you know, I think what's a really interesting, because even every time we do this, I pause and just start thinking about all the different roles that we play. I mean, it's just this interesting thing. And what are the roles today that I play uh, in the family dynamics business? Uh, what are those roles? I'll even say kind of these unwritten rules, uh, which maybe we might get to later, but there's definitely some dynamics that Kate mentioned of um, the relationship that we both have with our parents. I don't think I'm speaking out of turn uh, of what this is, but Kate and dad definitely butt heads quite a bit. Uh, maybe I'll say that uh, loosely. Lovingly. Yeah, uh, <laughs> on uh, money, finance, that kind of thing. Uh, so it has been an interesting thing. So the role that I now play is the mediator between the two of us. Uh, she runs the HR, uh, accounting, finance, that type of the business. So she tees up all the money conversations. She gets it all ready for me. And then I'm the one uh, that goes and has the conversation with dad. Um, and I know we kind of chat about that later a little bit. but Well, I think even with that, and then yeah. we'll move on, because I want to make sure we yeah. get through all the different sections. But that's actually saying in the future, I do, I realize that my dad and I, if we continued having certain kinds of conversations, what matters most to me is to have an awesome relationship with my dad. And being us talking about work stuff was not gonna actually help us be able to get that. So I did have to go to Jenny and say, I don't know how to handle this, but if you could step in, that would be awesome until we can figure out how to start working together. So again, it is actually saying like this, what the current situation was is not, I realized was just not healthy for me anymore. and I. Some of it is we can't change other people. I've had some other stuff with my mom that I've recently said, I have to put up boundaries and I'm no longer going to have a conversation like this. You keep talking about it. We're just not going to talk about it together. And so it's actually like I'm not asking you to change. I just need you to respect that I don't want to have this conversation ever again. And those types of things happen when you're trying to then say in my dream space, there's certain things I don't want to talk to my mom about. And so I just, you know, then you have to start taking the actions to be able to get from where we are today to where we want to get in the future. And again, this takes time. It, we can't get to like our dream state overnight just because we write it on a piece of paper. We have to then start doing the messy work to be able to get there and being brave enough to have the uncomfortable conversations. And that's what a lot of it comes down to as well. Yeah. So I think, so what we had on the first um, half of your page, I think I've got it over here, but... Um, was really around the family dynamics, right? And so we were talking about where is it today? And I know we're rushing you through. This is like, this is to be able to take home with you. This is at least to start the conversation, what we'll be doing a lot more at the uh, retreat, plus some other things. But um, also a really big part of um, this work is not just thinking about you uh, within the family dynamics state, right? It's also coming up with a future plan for you personally um, and professionally, and that could be out of the business as well, of what are other things that need to be happening in there. So uh, the futures work, um, actually, I think I always say it's like our COVID hobby that we came up with, but during COVID, both Kate and I became certified futurists. I have a strategic foresight work. It's a whole lot of fun. So any sort of conversations about the future, I would love to be able to chat about, but that is where it's a very big fun uh, place to be in. And by visualizing different options and coming up with different scenarios about where we want to be in the future um, is really helpful in order to start dreaming and start coming up with options of where we are. And so for the second half of this and on the back stage, um, piece of the piece of paper, I want you to just pause um, of where we are and be thinking personally, so again, it does not have to be about with the business, right? Of like personally, what is it that you want in the future? And then professionally, it could be in the business or out, what do you want to have going on in the future? And sometimes what we put down here, because sometimes it's like, I have no idea where the future holds. I, I don't know what where I wanna be. I mean, I don't think Kate would have thought I'm gonna be climbing to Everest and do all these other crazy things that I'm sure she'll mention. She's kind of an all in her kind of person. Uh, but uh, maybe it's also starting with what I don't want, you know? So I know going forward, I do not want to be doing this. I do not want to be doing that. So as we're creating the future, it doesn't just have to be what we do want to have happen, but what is it that we want to be able to let go of? So we can just spend a few minutes on the back side of that. So the front side was all around family dynamics, how you're connected in with your family, but just personally, what is it that you want? Um, and you could be using whatever time frame again. I don't think that we had a time frame on the top but uh, maybe the same time frame that you had on the front, uh, if you want or pick a different one, but is there anything personally and professionally that you did not have uh, on the front side of that? 
uh, that we can just spend a couple minutes filling that, that piece out. Music, thank you. <laughs> thinking about Willie doing that song. And I was like, oh, Jesus, I'm singing all of a sudden. <laughs> no, we are not. All right, we're going to bring you back again. And I know we're going really fast. We usually uh, work with coaching clients where we do something, go through this in about a six or eight week period. So then we spend each coaching session over that time frame digging into each one of those and then really working through a plan to be able to kind of get started moving from today to the future vision. Uh, so again, we'll be working with Peter to kind of understand a little bit more about how we could dig a little deeper at the next gen conference. But we're going to keep going for the sake of, I think we stand in between you guys and cocktails. So so we will just keep ourselves going here. Um, so our next things, we actually then on page three, we're going to talk through all four of these, and then we'll do one last break for you to keep jotting things down. So again, we'll go through some questions, but they'll ha they'll be within the app, the, the presentations in there, or feel free to take questions. But the A in the family framework stands for assumptions. And so really, I think, oh, sorry, I got to change the slide. Thank you. The A in assumptions stands for, or the A in the family framework stands for assumptions, and we all have different assumptions, right? We have the assumption of um, things like my family won't support me, or they don't believe that I can do X, Y, Z, or whatever those different narratives are, right? And then we also have our own assumptions about ourselves or limiting beliefs, and so we're kind of packaging both of those under this A section, and limiting beliefs could be like I always said, I'm not a good writer, I'm not a runner, I'm not thinking, so I then wrote a little sticky note, it sits on my desk that says, I'm an amazing writer, so that every time I start to have this negative limiting belief, then I'm trying to flip that on its you know, head and that type of thing. So we wanna be able to say how our, one is part of this would then be writing down what are the different assumptions or limiting beliefs that we have today, and then what if we started to flip those? What else could be true? How else do we, could we look at some of these types of things? So just an example and a story of kind of our history, because we always just say things between the two, or about the two of us here. But I came to Jenny and said, as she said, I am an all-inner. So I came to Jenny and said I had this really amazing opportunity. And again, I needed achievements outside of the business. And I had been on the board of a local nonprofit, and they had asked me to chair their capital campaign. So originally, we were supposed to raise $12 million. I said, hey, what do you think that we should do? And Jenny said, I think it's a horrible idea. You should not do it. And so yeah. then I thought that meant that 
she didn't think that I could actually succeed at it. And I felt really offended and hurt by that. But what did I do? I did not listen to my sister and I successfully raised $15 million and I'm super excited about it. Um, but out of that too, the more I was like, I know that I need this for myself and I need to be able to do this. And it makes me really sad that my sister doesn't believe in me. And so I could continue to carry along that assumption and that belief. But finally one day, again, this is through a lot of time. I feel like we would have gotten there a lot faster if we went to therapy. We didn't, but we probably should have. Um, but I finally said to her, you know, I have to just tell you, it really hurt my feelings that you didn't believe in me. And she basically said... Well, what? This was like four years later, you know? So this was seven years, I think, the campaign-ish. Uh, I had no idea. I had no idea. I mean, I vividly remember sitting on the couch at home. She called me up. She said, hey, I'm going to do this capital campaign. I'm going to raise $12 million. I was like, what are you talking about? That's a terrible idea. I, and then I moved on. Like, I didn't even have any concept that she then carried that with her for four years. Uh, I didn't. And quite honestly, what I was thinking in my head was not she can't do it because I think she can do anything she sets her mind to. I was thinking, I don't even like doing the Girl Scout cookie thing, you know, and you got to like, asked to buy whatever boxes the thought of raising 12 million dollars the first thing i thought was i could never do that so that's a terrible idea it was it had nothing to do with her i will say the second thing did have a lot to do with her but i more thought um it's going to take you away from the business and that is a full-time job doing that and so i think it's a terrible idea um and of course she did not listen she signed up and did it and um but a few things came out of that one it was through a lot of different learning opportunities that now we put things on the table. But I didn't have any concept that she was carrying around this assumption that I didn't believe in her. For four years, she carried that around of what it was, which was a lot. I also have come to realize in an, another assumption of mine, and I think there's unconscious and conscious assumptions. I don't need in my, you know, and just being twins and how different we are, I don't need words of affirmation. Like, it's, it's not my thing. I don't need someone to be like, hey, good job, Jenny. Like, you did a good job. You know, yay, you. It, it just doesn't, it's not my thing. I don't need it for whatever. Um, and I had no concept that Katie needed it. Like, she, like fanfare. she <laughs> needs that. Bring me it, a banner that says I did a good oh job. Oh, my gosh. I, I <laughs> literally had no idea. So I didn't do it. I didn't tell her good job during the day because we're just doing our job and we're just doing our thing. I just didn't, it wasn't even like I thought that she needed what I needed. It was just that I didn't even think, honestly, did not think. But she finally came, and I also didn't know that she needed wins outside the business because she didn't tell me. I worked outside the business, so I don't know if that's why I didn't need the wins, but I didn't think that she needed that. So we just learned a whole lot in this entire um, situation. One, if she would have come and presented this to me differently and said, hey, listen, Jenny, this means a lot to me that um, I need a win outside the business. Um, I'm looking to figure this out. This is the way that we're going to do it. This is how things would be. I think things would have gone so much differently from that. And then Kate was honest enough at some point, and it was through the process to say, I need you, Jenny, to say good job. I, well, and you used to say a little bit because it's always, you know, um, uh, it, there is a lot about what our family has done and, you know, on the, on the shoulders of, on the whatever, shoulders of giants. There's a lot of things. And so there's a lot of like, thank you, dad, for this. And so always honoring the family. It's a big, big deal. And I don't have any problem with that. But finally, she said, I need a win of my own. And this was like, wait a second. She needs words of affirmation. She needs these things. And so then we started really coming out. But I just had no idea or concept that assumed that she was the same as me. I mean, we're twins and we could not be more different. <laughs> yeah, so I think on the assumptions and actually even out of this exercise and this example also comes back to us having to take ownership over the roles that we play in some of the stories that are out there, right? I did realize later on, I did not actually, and I don't know if I had fully consciously like figured out why I had to say yes to this, but I knew in my heart I needed to, but I probably, not probably, I 100% should have, positioned it differently to Jenny, and I then was carrying this assumption that she didn't believe in me, which really came down to a failure in communication, and I own that now in reflection. And so a lot of these types of things as we're going through here, it's not to say that we 
are always going to be have a role in some of it, but part of this exercise is also being able to say what role do we have in some of the situation or the assumptions that are happening right now. So that A is um, assumptions and limiting beliefs. We would love you to be able to write down what they are today and then what else might be true. What else are you not thinking about there? I will say just real quick, and we can move on to mindset, but just another quick example. And it, it, I mean, it's all communication in the middle of this, but going through this entire process too um, and clarifying how things are, like if things are triggering, right? So for a long time, my mom would lovingly say that we kicked dad out of the business. So she's like, oh, okay, you guys kicked dad out of the business, which I think that there's only one way of taking that and it's negatively, uh, especially because he's struggling in retirement. So gosh, if dad is struggling in retirement and mom is saying we kicked him out of the business, I'm taking that not a fantastic way. So we carried that for quite some time. She told her friends, she'd tell whoever would listen that that's what we did. So finally I said, mom, that is terrible. We did not kick dad out of the business. I don't know why you're saying that. She said, oh my God, I don't mean it that way. I am so proud of you guys that you guys are at a spot where you could then kick dad out and that you could be running this for yourself. I was like, that is not how that was taken uh, any way, shape or form. But it was, we've now are having these conversations where at least we can put things on the table to say, this is how it affects me. And that was years that she was saying that. So now we're at least starting of these things of it's like, man, that hurts. And sometimes, and I will say too, there are things it, that they could, she could mean that and she could come back. So it's not all the time that we're assuming wrong. I mean, they could say, yeah, I don't believe you. Or she could say, you did kick the dad out of the business, but it's good to have these clarifications of what they are. Um, mindset, because I'm going to kind of quickly go through here, but mindset is just really big um, in general of going through here, right? Of what is our mindsets today? Do we have a growth mindset, a fixed mindset? And this is a whole nother uh, concept that could be an entire um, piece here, but how are we typically responding to setbacks, to failures of what's going on? What is our mindset that we just have so much more control over these situations um, and assuming kind of positive intent when we're going in here? Yeah, and I think even with an example, as you're starting to think through, think through different times when you've actually gone into a family meeting or interacted with your family or in any way that is, were you showing up in the best, and, and what was your mindset when you went into that room? So you could say, my dad was not being, we always say talk dad because we just took over our dad's company. So that's how we reference Could be things. Mom. So, yeah. But um, my dad was being not very nice about this whole entire thing. Well, if we pause and actually say, I showed up because I actually got you know, my 18-year-old was doing all sorts of 18-year-old stuff, and so I showed up in not the best mindset, then I went in with a certain energy, and it just set the whole tone. So if I actually had a different mindset, a different way that I approached that, that whole engagement might have been different. So again, with mindset, that really does, again, come back to our ownership over it. And our mindset's going to change depending on the circumstance. And so spending some time of really digging in and saying, on a regular basis, what is my mindset? Where am I? And are there certain types of engagement engagements that I have with people that triggers me to flip to a different mindset. I think CJ actually talked earlier too, I wrote down just a note that she was saying um, that it's human nature that we're wired for scarcity and fear and that we have to be more intentional about abundant mindset. So, you know, I think that is, it's a great point that she was talking about from that EOS and that kind of mentality about intentional culture. And I think that really plays into mindset itself. I know too, Kate, whenever, um, like I'll come in, kind of, which she describes it, I'll come in hot to her office and she'll be like, hey, what happened? Like, what's going on right here? Because this has nothing to do with what's about. And I'm like, oh yeah, I know my kid, my this, my that. And okay, we got all that out. And now we can have a conversation. But now at least we've gotten to a spot where we can just kind of call each other out of what is happening here. So the I in the family framework is identity. Again, identity is one that we could spend a whole 90 minutes on. So this one's a really big one. And so really thinking through, again, our core values, what are some of the biggest accomplishments that you've had today? Um, Willie said, which I wrote down actually too, like he said, my identity is not tied to money. It's about my family, faith, and inspiring people. And so identity really is what, who do we want to be? How do we want to be known? That ties back into the character side of things. But again, it, through this exercise also is saying, 
Are there parts of my identity, are there parts of ways that people see me today that isn't actually who I want to be down the road? So are there things that I maybe need to start to change about my current identity because that's not actually how I want to be known as my longer term legacy? So this isn't always just on the positive side of things about who I want to be in this positive light. Sometimes, again, we have to take ownership for things about ourselves today that we know that we should be growing and changing in and taking those actions around in that. And I think that's tying back to then thinking about this future version of you. What is that person accomplishing? What are they doing? Like, how do you want to be known if that's not how you are today um, of having that identity of where we are? And then our last section on this page, the L in the family framework is legacy. So again, really thinking, we know that legacy and family business has really talked a lot about that wealth generation, assets, fan, larger family values, but again, thinking more about it from a personal standpoint. What does legacy actually mean to you? Are you able to define what that means? And what is your perspective and thought of the family legacy, not what have you been told that the family legacy is? So again, this whole entire thing at the end is being able to empower you with some thoughts, some ideas, and a vision so that when you're sitting down with your family, you feel empowered to be able to say, these are my ideas, these are my visions, this is my perspective, this is my definition of what legacy means. And so that's where this one, it's another big one where you want to be able to say, "Who? what do I want to be known for down the road? So for us, when we think even about, um, let's say, from community impact or philanthropy, our parents gave anonymously, which I think might be also a generational thing gave substantial amounts to the community, but nobody, like they were anonymous donors to the organizations, and none of our staff knew that the company was actually making community donations. And so it was all financial. But in our mind, when we first came in, I want to be able to, one, I want to empower our employees to know what they're working towards, that they have a say in being able to pick the charities that we're giving to, where they want to where they want to give to. And for us, too, we want, I'm excited that my kids get to stand on the Rucker family patio of the new Ronald McDonald house to be able to know that they helped build that. Like my 14 year old actually designed the logo for the capital campaign. And so that is, and her story is what, you know, got me involved in the charity to begin with. And I want that to be something where they knew that I put my time into it, not just money and resources in that way. And so again, it's kind of just a different way that we're defining, let's say, community impact from our parents. Because our parents were just like, we can make a, you know, a big impact, but nobody needs to know that we did it. Ours isn't so much to say that. I just figure if we can actually get everybody knowing that we're all working towards something, you know, way more than just like putting more into our savings account. Like our team loves the fact that they get to help pick what charities we give to and do volunteer activities with us and all of that. And so that was just kind of a switch on like how our definition of community impact for our personal legacies is different from our parents and our families. So. I know we went through this page pretty fast, uh, but we want to again take a couple more minutes of letting you dig into this and then we'll get to the last section before we wrap up.
of, of where we have. You know, I swear every single time, and it's starting to then think of, and I really think that this legacy, you know, there is something so special about being a part of a family business. Because um, I think as Kate said before, there's definitely the, the and, that we can be part of the legacy of our family business. And so I love this kind of, of you know, what part of the family business in that legacy do we want to be carrying forward? What is our torch there? But what do we want a part of that? And it's definitely a big thing for Kate and I. Um, I don't know about yours, but at least in our family, of both of our parents, um, their entire identities were wrapped up in the business. I mean, that's, I think, why they both definitely are struggling uh, in retirement. And part of our legacy is that we want to be able to have an impact uh, in the family business and carrying that forward of what do we want to do and kind of creating this family enterprise and some things for our kids to be able to have. But what do we want to have individually? And I think that's a really big part of this, part of this identity of Kate raising $15 million for Ronald McDonald House and I'm on the board of Team Kids and doing a lot of different pieces. And how can we be um, and have our wins outside of the family business as well? Um, I will say, um, even just going back to because I think it's okay to have, I mean, this is our opinion at least, to have wins and have your own identity outside of the business. One of the biggest things that really helped our business, I will say now afterwards that it was the right decision uh, to do this capital campaign uh, and raise all the money, one, for charity, because that's fantastic. Uh, two, our entire business has been transformed. Uh, we are very philanthropic forward uh, business, known in the community. I mean, I think your first ask was for like $3 million which is wild. So the training that Katie got uh, for sales, for marketing, being known in the community, for doing all of these things, it was huge. And so Kate and I now are known in the community, not just as Dawn's daughters anymore or just running McKinsey, but we have our own identity. And at the same time, it is causing McKinsey to be thriving. Um, it's a place that people want to be working, doing those types of things. So um, it's really, you know, an exciting thing. So uh, we, the last page of this, which we're not going to take um, a break because at least uh, we're almost out of time here. But the last page is bringing it all together, right? Like this is what we say, like we've got one life to live here, right? Of what is it that you want this to be? You know, we had worked with uh, some sisters a while ago down in San Diego. They ran a, a research company down there and a lot of, you know, mom, she doesn't believe in us and she's not giving us the reins in the business and, you know, she she won't let us decide of what to do. And there was a lot of back and forth. And so finally we looked at it and we said, well, what do you want to do? They're like, oh, well, what do you mean? I said, well, <laughs> what do you want to do in the family business? And they're like, well, we just didn't even know that we had a choice. We didn't know that we had the option to be able to decide what we wanted. So going through this process and realizing that we've got agency over our lives and we still have our family dynamics. And I mean, we can answer any sort of questions that you have because we want to be in full transparency. It was not like, hey, dad, we're taking over. OK. And that's what happened. I mean, there was a, this has been an entire journey and process, but making sure and coming up with your own plan to begin with of what you want, envisioning what you want, working backwards from there uh, is a really exciting uh, time there. So definitely open to any sort of questions that you have. We uh, whiz through this. The presentation is on the app uh, that's in there. But if anyone has any questions, uh, we are definitely here to answer on our transition on this plan uh, or afterwards. Yeah. Oh, oh. So we, have we had one come in through the app that I wanted to, to read to you guys, which yeah. is looking forward to the next generation beyond me. What are the top two or three things we should start to do to prepare for them and with them? So kind of a leading gen perspective on some of this. Yeah. Mm, I love that. I mean, I would say, so for us, and so Jenny and I, we have four girls between the two of us. So my oldest is 18 and your youngest is in third grade. I don't know. Nine. <laughs> Nine. Um, and so we really, one, we share very openly and honestly with our kids, kind of just dyna family dynamics. We talk a lot more about that. I think it's just different generations too. I mean, those younger kids, man, they know how to articulate their feelings a lot better than maybe all of us did. And they are very happy to tell you what they think and they're open to that. But we actually really do encourage those types of conversations. I mean, my young one tells me very strongly what she's comfortable with or not. And I said, listen, these are behaviors that I've been 
that I'd like to start doing, but I respect your opinion and I'd like to try to work to change that, but I'm not gonna be able to change overnight, so I hope you can give me some grace. So we're also with our leading generation or that next like young, young ones, we're really trying to start shifting some of those family dynamics. Again, as Jenny said, uh, with our future stuff, we did a future family business project and we were actually thinking, will family dynamics be fundamentally, or family communication be fundamentally different in maybe 50 years? Because again, these young ones are talking about things that we never, you know, we weren't normally talking about and our parents definitely didn't. So I think some of it is how we can start doing things to prepare is one is also asking them what they're interested in and being able to help them. I mean, the blessing of family businesses and even talking about innovation, I, I've like mapped out business plans with my like, she was 16 at the time and we came up with the whole plan and I was like, all right, she's like, will you help me set up an Etsy shop? I'm like, I will totally help you set up with an Etsy shop. Once you do a PowerPoint presentation on what your marketing plan is, your advertising plan and your growth plan is. And so she's like, I don't know what that means. I'm like, great, go to Google or chat GPT. It's going to tell you. You know what weird? She didn't actually do that and we didn't make an Etsy plan. But I then was saying, if we want to come up with new ideas, I am 100% here for it. You have to do a little bit of work before I'm going to do it. So I think we have these opportunities to pass innovation, business development, all these things down in ways that are obviously age, you know, um, appropriate for our kids, but there's a lot of things that we can start doing as parents now for our younger, like, younger kids. I think also, I think that the, in there when she was talking about with the Fredo uh, situation of maybe somebody that their passion isn't this business, it might not need to look exactly the way that you did it, you know, and that was a bit of a fantastic thing for dad. Um, that we're not running the business the exact way that he did. We've got amazing team members, but what is it um, that just because it doesn't have to look like, and we did not want to work 24-7, we didn't want to be doing exactly the way dad did, but it's still a, a thriving, exciting business. So just because you might have a next gen that doesn't want to do it the exact same way, or how do you pivot and grow? I mean, we're a family enterprise, and so now we're taking on other ideas and other businesses, and so it doesn't just have to be the way it has always been. Uh, yeah. Maybe one more question, one or two more questions in the room. Anyone? If not, then not. Let's give a round of applause for Katie and Jenny. Thank you. Yeah, thank you to both of you. We appreciate it. Uh, uh, just a couple of quick notes here before we send all of you guys off. Uh, we've mentioned the Next Gen Retreat a couple of times. That's going to be October 2nd and 3rd in Keystone, South Dakota. Mark your calendars for that. Please be there. I think it's a really rare opportunity to have a room full of next gens uh, for a couple of days to talk about specific uh, things to next gens, uh, especially without your parents in the room. Uh, so that's always that's always valuable. Um, later on this evening at 5:30, so in just a little under an hour, we're all going to be meeting at Monic Yards for Taste of Family Business. We have a gourmet menu of uh, food put together with. Uh, family business items, so a bunch of family uh, ag producers, and so everything from, from ice cream to, to buffalo is going to be on the menu, so please do, please do, it. and buns, as buns are going to are gonna be there, I can't forget about the buns, um, so that's, that's going to be great, it's happening at Monarch Yards at 530, please be there, it's included in your ticket, so just show up, it'll be, it'll be a great time, and then the uh, last thing that I want to mention is tomorrow morning at 730, uh, in this room, so the big room, there's going to be roundtables uh, with our sponsors. So this is a great opportunity to go and connect with our sponsors about the topics that they have their tables set up around. Uh, like Stephanie mentioned earlier, there's no hourly rate associated with those tables, so it's a really great opportunity to ask questions of uh, these, these professional advisors who are all here specifically to serve family businesses. That's why they plug into PFBA in the first place is that's their... Uh, that's their focus. So really take advantage of that. That's a really valuable opportunity. Like Stephanie said, uh, divide and conquer, you know, try and hit a lot of them, you know, take your family and, and, and see how many you can you can talk to because it'll it's a very valuable time. But with that, thank you to the two of you. Very valuable. We're looking forward to seeing you in October. And thanks to you uh, all one more time. A round of applause for these two.